Okay, I guess uh, we'll start. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, be here today. <coughs> Actually, the place where I uh, started my medical studies uh, around 20 years ago. Um, and today we'll take you into a, a visit and a journey um, into a new world that was uh, discovered uh, to us uh, in its entirety just uh, eight or nine years ago, which is the microbiome. And uh, when we speak about the microbiome, um, we speak about a gigantic, diverse, and poorly understood uh, microbial ecosystem that uh, resides within each and every one of you and every human in the world uh, from the day we're born until the day we die. Um, and in the last eight or nine years, it was discovered to have uh, fundamental importance in almost every aspect of our physiology. Um, and um, when we talk about the microbiome, I think uh, one picture may be better than a thousand than words. And um, this is one of these pictures. This is a um, scanning electron microscopy photo taken from a normal gastrointestinal tract, like the one you have inside you, um, with 160,000 magnification. And what you can see here are those uh, what looks like hills or bumps. These are the lining epithelium that covers your gastrointestinal tract. But you can also see above it what looks like a carpet of shoelaces. And each of these shoelaces are in one of your uh, microbiome bacteria. And you can already appreciate how gigantic the, the number and, and uh, scope of these um, microbes are within us and how closely they interact with the host uh, um, in very intimate uh, relationships. And I think we'll uh, start by a little bit dwelling into the historical aspects of, of the microbiome and how it was discovered, uh, because I think it will teach us something very important. And actually, if, if we look at uh, modern science, uh, we experience a very important, very <coughs> fascinating uh, microbiology revolution that uh, really happened um, in the latter half of uh, the 19th century, when a group of amazing geniuses, uh, including the gentleman that you see here and many more, uh, used very primitive techniques such as the light microscopy to define um, the small microorganisms that surround us, the, uh, mainly bacteria. Um, this has become really the golden age. Uh, people uh, described these microbes and studied these microbes. And, and uh, of course, these microbes were not only interesting and important, but were also the number one cause of mortality worldwide. So, so uh, this became a, a very important field. and. Um, and um, <coughs> the microbes were kind of perceived as the evil guys for over a century. Um, there was one guy that, that needs to be mentioned here, one of these geniuses uh, named Eli Michnikov, uh, um, really a, a, a fascinating uh, Jewish scientist, uh, the winner of one of the first uh, Nobel Prizes, who defined modern immunology, uh, phagocytosis actually was discovered by him, that uh, took upon himself to uh, actually look under the light microscope in, in his own stool sample, and he was amazed to see many, many moving uh, bacteria. Um, and he understood that these probably are very important, and he hypothesized that these were probably important to our physiology. In fact, for his entire adult life, um, he drank a glass of sour milk every day, thinking that somehow he would be able to modify these creatures and to improve his health. And um, at some point, he even wrote a completely theoretical book, which he termed an optimistic studies, in which uh, he hypothesized that the microbiome would be very important to human longevity. He had absolutely no way to study these microbes because these microbes are mostly unculturable under normal conditions. This was whole, all um, theoretical. And because science has evolved uh, to very other different uh, and, and interesting uh, topics, the, the study of our internal microbes kind of uh, completely uh, remained neg negligible and unstudied uh, for almost a century. And this uh, really changed not many years ago, in 2001, when uh, we experienced another re revolution, which we termed the genomic revolution. Uh, part of the Human Genome Project involved uh, breakthroughs, technological breakthroughs that enable for the first time to massively sequence and characterize large chunks of genomic data. And these very, f very same uh, technologies enable us for the first time to actually look at the genetic makeup of these trillions of microbes that live within us, even if we cannot culture them. And, and of course, the, the pricing uh, in the last 10 or 15 years uh, has drastically dropped. The first human that was sequenced uh, cost over a billion dollars, and today we do it at the lab for less than $800 for the same sequence of the same person. And um, th this was uh, a major breakthrough that enabled us to look at our internal microbes for the first time. But still, what was missing was uh, any testimony of their importance, of their physiological context. And this 
discovery, this um, important uh, step forward happened in 2006 when um, a scientist from WashU named Jeff Gordon published a, a paper in Nature that really shocked the microbiology field. And, and this paper included a very s simple uh, observation. So what uh, Jeff did, he took a, a group of normal mice, <coughs> such as the mice on the left, and mice that uh, suffer from morbid obesity, these are leptin deficient, OB, OB mice that have uh, a defect that um, renders them uh, always hungry. So they eat and eat and eat until they become morbidly obese. And what Jeff did, he took the microbiome, he took the gut microbes from the gastrointestinal tract of these obese mice and of these uh, thin mice, and he transferred them into mice that we call germ-free mice, which are mice that are housed under very s special conditions in these specialized isolators and are kept completely sterile. These germ-free mice have no microbiome of their own. They have no bugs on their skin, no bugs in their mouth, no bugs in their gastrointestinal tract. And when he transferred the microbiomes from either the obese or the thin mice into these sterile mice, he noticed within two weeks that the mice that received the microbiomes from the obese mice almost doubled their weight as compared to mice that received the microbes from the thin mice. So, so this was very surprising. It was met with a lot of, I would say, skepticism by, by the world, which means that he was right. Um, and, and, and it actually provided us with the first evidence that the microbiome actually features a very strong, very interesting, very important uh, influence on our physiology. Did he do a co-housing experiment? No, he didn't do any co-housing experiments. Co-housing came a little later, actually in works that we and others have done five years later. So we'll, we'll get to that. And uh, I think since 2006, the, the field of uh, microbiome research has uh, become uh, very uh, important and very popular. And you can see what, what, uh, how it reflects uh, in terms of uh, uh, publications. Um, and, and we'll cover kind of a highlight some of the aspects related to this new and exciting field. So b before we dive in, into mechanistic details, I think it's important to, to say a few words about the, the tools that we in this field uh, are using, because this will be very helpful down, down the, the lecture. So uh, as I said before, we heavily uh, rely on next generation sequencing, which allows us to sequence um, um, these complex mixed populations of, of bacteria, even when we are unable to isolate them or to culture them. And we do this in many different levels. So the shallowest level, um, includes um, sequencing of a single gene, the 16S ribosomal DNA gene, which is a highly conserved, a highly important uh, gene in, in uh, uh, bacteria. Actually, it exists and it is expressed in every bacteria, and it is the number one transcribed gene in all bacteria. If you would do an RNA-seq of any bacteria, 95% of the transcript would be for this structural element. And since it is so important and so evolutionary conserved, um, it is very similar between bacteria, except very small hypervariable regions that enable us by sequencing to differentiate between microbes and microbial families and to tell what is the relative abundance of different components of a mixed microbial ecosystem. So this enables us to study the composition of a microbiome. But we, in the, I would say that in the <coughs> last three years, we go much deeper than this. We are not just interested to, to know what are the members of any given microbiome configuration. We are very interested to know what functions these mixed populations confer. And in order to do this, we, we use next-gen sequencing in a much deeper and more complex manner. For example, in a, um, in a method that we call uh, shotgun metagenomic sequencing, we, just, we don't just sequence a single <coughs> gene, like the 16S ribosomal DNA gene, but we sequence all the genes of all the microbes in a given microbiome configuration. And then we heavily rely on computational analysis that gives us uh, um, characteristics of functional importance in a given configuration, such as the, the variability in genes. We can assemble genes into metabolic pathways. We can assemble pathways into higher functions that require different pathways in order to, to occur. And this, for the first time, gives us some uh, information about the function of different microbiome configurations. In the last two years, we go even further and we go beyond genomics and we start going into what we call metabolomics, in which we sequence by mass spec dependent techniques um, the tens of thousands of small polar and nonpolar molecules that are associated with different microbiome configurations. These are molecules that are either synthesized by the microbes, modulated by the microbes, degraded by the microbes. And in many ways, we are finding, and I'll show you some examples from our work and from other people's work, that these small molecules actually constitute uh, the alphabet by which the microbes and the host communicate with each other via signaling. Um, and, and these are an immense biochemical ocean of 
potentially bioactive molecules that we know nothing about and exist within each and every one of you as we speak. Um, and, and together, these methodologies enable us to go from composition into function. And one other very important um, method that uh, we use in the microbiome research, uh, and I mentioned it before, are germ-free mice. These are these uh, sterile mice that we house in specialized isolator. This is, a, this is our very own uh, large germ-free facility at the Weizmann Institute. And these sterile mice enable us to do two important things. First, they enable us to compare what happens to a mammal in the absence of microbes versus in the normal condition in which it contains microbes. So, so every alteration in function that we find in germ-free mice is the beginning of a project or the beginning of a scientific question that we can pursue because it means that the microbes are doing something to enable this function. But more importantly, what these germ-free uh, mice enable us is to actually test given microbiome configurations or single commensal microbes, if we can isolate them, um, for their causality, for their functionality, when we transfer these configurations from either diseased animals or diseased uh, uh, humans into these sterile germ-free mice. So we can model either mice or humans using these systems, and we can move from the association or correlation stage, which, which, is, um, which has marked the field in the very first years of its existence, towards the understanding of causality in a molecular-based uh, level of understanding. And, and this is the, the very diverse set of tools that we use in my lab, uh, including all of these and, and many more, <coughs> in which we try to um, characterize uh, uh, different functions of the microbiome and to try to understand them uh, in a, a deeper molecular mechanistic uh, level. And when we use all of these uh, techniques, we, the world, was really amazed to find that uh, we've hit a treasure. So um, when you count, for example, the number of bacteria that reside within your gastrointestinal tract, and we have microbiomes all over our body, but the gastrointestinal tract is the most uh, densely populated uh, region uh, in which our commensal microbes uh, um, reside, we find that um, the number of microbes roughly equals the total number of human cells in our body. So, so this is a very big chunk of, uh, of, of our human uh, machine that we, we couldn't study and we, we, we couldn't refer to for over 100 years of, of modern research. And when we count the genes that this microbiome represents, we find an even more striking uh, uh, number. Uh, so we have around uh, 20,000 human genes, but when we count our microbial genes, we have over 3 million microbial genes. Well, and while these were fully annotated and, and, and uh, characterized to, to, to a large extent, these 3 million genes mostly remain unknown. So, so this is a, a huge part of what we call the meta-organism, which we're not trying to, to figure out and to understand. <coughs> the microbiome uh, resides within us from the day we are born until the day we die. We actually acquire it when we are born from our parents and then from our environment. Uh, in humans, it reaches its adult configuration uh, within two to three years of age. And then if you live in a very stable environment, you eat roughly the same food, you don't travel a lot, you don't have, take medications, your microbiome, at least in a high level, and I'll show you some different views of that uh, in a few slides, uh, remains uh, constant, uh, constant and stable, but the microbiome is very sensitive to any change in, in, in your physiology, any, cha any environmental change, any internal change would very quickly and very reproducibly reflect on the composition and the function of your microbiome. And as I said before, we mainly focus on the gut microbiome, which is uh, the most, one of the most densely, my, de densely populated microbial cultures on Earth, and it exists within you. Uh, but we have microbes residing in any place in which we meet our environment, in which our body meets the world. We have uh, e um, microbial ecosystems on our skin, in our genitourinary tract, in our mouth in our upper respiratory tract and in our gastrointestinal tract. Each of these has evolved differently with different properties that uh, are needed in these specific regions. And each of these are uh, associated with uh, different physiological functions or propensity to different diseases. And when we start to study these and to tease these apart, <coughs> um, the, the world is finding that the microbiome, and especially the gut microbiome, which is the most heavily studied microbiome of all of them, is, oh, I have some Hebrew here, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, the microbiome is, is um, associated and is, is connected um, to almost any physiological function that you can imagine, stemming from development, nutrition, immune function, fertility, you name it. 
And furthermore, what is becoming really interesting uh, uh, as well is that you know, if you open any of the major uh, journals, the scientific journals uh, in the last uh, four years, you would find that uh, different microbiomes have been associated or correlated with uh, a contribution or a propensity to develop many diseases. And many of these diseases are not these rare, rare monogenic diseases, but very common multifactorial diseases. And some examples um, are um, displayed here. Of course, the, the billion dollar question is not this association, but what are the bugs or their functions that are associated or that are driving these disease processes? So, you know, I, I want to just uh, give you a few examples before we go into our own studies of different diseases that, that have been uh, associated with microbiome, just to give you kind of a, a, an overview of, of how um, diverse the microbiome has uh, become um, or suspected to be. So, so we've talked about obesity and we've talked about Jeff Gordon's uh, original 2006 uh, breakthrough study uh, showing or suggesting that in mice uh, the microbiome can transmit disease susceptibility or obesity susceptibility by its transfer um, across animals, which means if you take it one step forward that diseases such as obesity are in many ways infectious. So we, we never regarded them as infectious, but at least in the microbiome sense they are infectious. Um, so after three quite tough years of, of debate on these mice studies, um, the world has discovered that this uh, phenomenon uh, is actually true when the same experiment was repeated in humans and was, was found to confer the same phenotype. So in a follow-up study just published a couple of years ago, um, um, a group of uh, human twins, some of which were identical twins, uh, were selected. And these twins were, were, were special because one twin was very obese and the other twin was not very obese. So the genetics were uh, not very different between these uh, pairs of obese individuals, but their phenotype in terms of obesity was. And when the microbiome was collected from these two, uh, um, these, these pairs of twins and transferred into germ-free mice, the same exact phenotype that I've shown you before uh, was transferred into mice. So mice that received the obese twin microbiome gained a lot of weight in comparison to mice that received the microbiome from the non-obese twin. So, so this kind of proved that this concept goes across species. This is true not only in the one extreme of obesity, but also in the, in the other side of things, which is malnutrition in a different study, actually also by the Jeff Gordon group. Um, they actually studied pairs of twins that they collected um, in Malawi, um, an African uh, country that uh, is characterized by, by a relatively high rate of malnutrition. And again, they could find quite easily pairs of twins in this country in which one twin was suffering from severe malabsorption or malnutrition, while the other twin was normal weight and non-malnutritious. Uh, nutri um, they uh, collected the, the microbiome from these uh, twins, they shipped them to Washu, and they transferred them into germ-free mice. And what they found was the exact mirror image of what I've shown you before. So when they transferred the microbiome from a, from a malnourished uh, twin, mice lost dramatically more weight as compared to uh, mice that were transferred with the normal weight uh, twin, uh, twin individual. And here we learned something new, which is the effect of diet on the microbiome. So this really dramatic phenotype occurred only when the mice were fed the exact diet that the Malawians uh, like to eat. And when you uh, change the mice from this African diet back to Western diet, these differences become much le less pronounced, which, which tells us that um, these phenotypes that the microbiome contributes to are highly dependent on the dietary composition that the microbes are exposed to. And from that, you know, the world exploded. And as I said, you know, you, 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 you name a disease and I'll show you some papers claiming that there is an association and, and correlation to these diseases. Some of these studies, I would gently say, are better than others, um, but, um, but, but some are very interesting. For example, <coughs> the microbiome in brain function, there's a lot of hype about, uh, about that. Just a week ago, there was a big cell paper about uh, the microbiome contributing to uh, Parkinson's disease through the secretion of several metabolites called short-chain fatty acids, um, um, and there are many other neuro-related diseases that are suggested to be correlated or associated with uh, microbiome uh, changes. And, um, you know, you can take it to more uh, maybe stranger uh, examples. Uh, you, can, you can regard the microbiome as a sophisticated fingerprint. For example, in one study uh, by, by um, a researcher named Rob Knight, he sequenced the fingers of a group of students, and he also sequenced the computer keypad of these students blindly, and then he tried computationally to link um, 
a keypad to a student, and you can see that when you use the principal component analysis, you can very easily link the through the microbiome which uh, computer came from which uh, student. So you can imagine the microbiome is a very maybe cool uh, uh, fingerprint, and from there you can you know imagine where the field is taking these uh, findings. For example, the studies uh, tracing uh, rare or endangered animals and forensic uses, and you know you can you can uh, imagine. Uh, the uses there. Actually, there's a paper just published claiming that you can determine the time from death by the changes in the microbiome. So if uh, a person died four, four days ago and you uh, collect and sequence their microbiome, this study claims that you can reliably say when <coughs> the time of death occurred, and, and so on and so forth. And then you take it to more bizarre areas, <coughs> and this is my very favorite uh, example. You may think that, uh, for example, sexual preferences are stemming from uh, love and passion, and I'm here to tell you that this is, this is all wrong. Um, it, it's it's al actually all coming from the microbiome, at least in, in Drosophila. So this is a study, <coughs> this is a study actually uh, performed um, in, in Caltech uh, a few years ago. The postdoc was an Israeli guy named Gil Sharon, and uh, what he did um, is, is a very interesting study in which they took uh, um, a group of identical Drosophila and they grew them for 37 generations on different food uh, preparations that resulted in uh, two genetically identical drosophila having very diverse and different microbiome configurations than one another. Then they took these, uh, these uh, two very diverse, di divergent uh, families and they put them together. They marked them, they put them together, they grew them for another three generations. So the end result were drosophila, you know, they didn't know who their grandparents uh, were and what microbiome they had, they're drosophila, and they measured their mating preferences. And what they found was that 95% of the mating preferences were completely dependent on the microbiome. So, uh, so Drosophila flies preferred to mate with other Drosophila flies that carried the same microbiome from the same original uh, family that they shared. Um, this was claimed to be related to the microbiome because when they did the same experiment with germ-free Drosophila, this didn't happen. When they gave antibiotics to these Drosophila, they lost this behavior. When they uh, gave them back kind of probiotics uh, um, reconstituting their very limited microbiome, they uh, could uh, observe the partial reconstitution of the phenotype. So this is just tells you that the observations are very interesting. Of, of course, the, the, the million dollar question is whether this is uh, true in higher animals and what is the mechanism. Um, now, we, we in, in my lab, regard the microbiome, if you may, as a signaling hub that, that integrates into it many signals that come from um, the, the, the host, the host, for example, the host genetics, the host immune uh, system, but also many other signals that come from our environment, and I've shown you a few examples, I'll show you a few examples more. And uh, our data points to the microbiome as, as an integrator of all of this data. The microbiome takes these signals, perceives them, and communicates them to the host. And we believe that the secret to many of these correlations lies with the understanding of these communication networks on the molecular basis and what perturbed them that leads to susceptibility to major disease. So to give you an example of, of the effect of the host genetics of the microbiome, a study um, a couple of years ago from, from Great Britain um, examined uh, uh, 500 pairs of human twins, some of whom were um, monozygotic, some of whom were dizygotic twins, and they found a significant association between the genotype of the twins and the similarity in their microbiome. So this association was not very strong, but it was statistically significant, meaning that in some aspects the human genome affects um, the composition and the function of our microbiome. Um, if we refer to uh, another uh, endogenous uh, influence on the microbiome, which is the immune uh, uh, system or the immune response, this is very close to what uh, we do in our lab. Um, and, and this is very intuitive because uh, if you think about it, at least in the gastrointestinal tract, in parallel to this uh, amazing evolution of the trillions of uh, microbial uh, species uh, and members um, that reside within uh, a mammalian um, gastrointestinal tract, we also witness um, um, a co-evolution of, of a very intricate, very, um, very sophisticated immune response that in, in a high level is there to ensure that um, our good microbes that are so important to, to many aspects that, that we need um, are, you know, are uh, supported 
while, uh, and, and are not uh, inciting a, a, an immunological anti-infectious response. Otherwise, we would all be dead uh, with this load of microbes that we carry around us. But this immune system also preserves the capability to very aggressively <coughs> react when uh, things are breached, when, when the uh, system is breached, and when a pathogen is introduced into this microbial ecosystem. Now, is the microbiome important for the normal development of the immune response? The answer is a clear yes. There are many examples uh, for this. Um, one classical example is, is a study which showed that um, a very important part of the anti-infectious immune response called TH17 response, um, uh, which is a T cell response uh, uh, characterized by the secretion of a very important cytokine IL-17, is totally, totally dependent on the microbiome. And it is not just dependent on the microbiome, it is dependent on special, uh, specialized family of microbes that are carried uh, within us. And when these uh, microbes are missing from a given microbiome, you can see in this uh, flow cytometry um, figure that um, this uh, population of cells is completely missing. So m whole population of immune cells and whole function of immune cells are completely dependent on uh, the microbiome. In my lab, uh, we study a particular type of uh, immune responses which are related to what we call inflammasome signaling. So inflammasomes are innate immune uh, sensors. Th these are sensors of either infectious or endogenous stress responses um, that are, uh, are comprised by um, a set of uh, multi-protein uh, uh, complexes that assemble by a highly regulated process. And once such sensing occurs and such uh, a complex uh, is formed, um, a mature inflammasome can elicit very potent uh, inflammation by uh, activation by cleavage of uh, mainly of two cytokines, IL-1 beta and IL-18, which um, in many different contexts elicit uh, a potent inflammatory response. So you can, you can actually imagine inflammasomes as sensors of infection or of endogenous sterile stress. Um, and as such, they are very attractive candidates to being sensors by which the host may um, sense the, um, its, its internal microbial world and differentiate it between friend and foe and, and decide whether um, uh, to elicit an inflammatory response when, when uh, danger comes or to uh, induce tolerance when the commensals are all happy and everything is okay, in which case we are very, the, the evolution uh, um, dictates that we would uh, not induce a potentially harmful inflammatory response. And what uh, we've discovered, actually during my postdoc at Yale University, uh, was the first non-hematopoietic inflammasome, which we termed the NLRP6 inflammasome. Um, we term it this way because the upper, uh, or, or one of the proteins in this, in this cytoplasmic complex is called NLRP6. This is actually the protein which we believe uh, is the sensor of whatever infectious or activation uh, signal. And what, uh, what we found was that this new inflammasome is highly expressed on intestinal epithelial cells. It is basically expressed almost exclusively in these uh, uh, intestinal epithelial cells, and, and there uh, it plays a very important role in the promotion of homeostasis uh, in the gastrointestinal tract because uh, when we breach any component, when we genetically ablate any component of this multi-protein uh, uh, comple multi complex, we uh, completely disrupt homeostasis in many different ways, <laughs> including the uh, initiation of dysregulation of the microbiota composition and function, which we term dysbiosis. And when this dysbiosis ensues, then the mouse becomes highly sensitive uh, or highly prone to develop many context-specific uh, uh, phenotypic alterations, uh, including uh, infection, or inflammation, such as uh, um, inflammatory bowel disease. In other contexts, these mice are prone to develop uh, features of what we call the metabolic syndrome, obesity, fatty liver, adult onset diabetes. And in other models, these same microbiome-dependent processes may contribute uh, to the development of cancer, such as colorectal cancer. So, so this, this mouse model uh, was really uh, important in studying host sensing of the microbiome and also to in linking uh, or conceptually linking microbiome uh, alterations to the propensity to uh, many important diseases. One other very, uh, I think, interesting uh, discovery was that this microbiome was dominant over a wild type microbiome. So if we take this altered microbiome in inflammasome deficient mice and we transfer it into wild type mice that harbor a completely normal microbiome, this disease associated microbiome actually takes over the wild type microbiome. It hijacks the microbiome 
and it also transfers disease susceptibility to this completely normal wild type host. It has a normal inflammasome. And after this transfer is complete, this wild type host also develops susceptibility to the very same set of context specific phenotypes. So, so this is another kind of co-evolutionary question that this model allowed us to study in more detail. And I'll highlight just one of the studies. Sure. Um, in that situation, is the level of the inflammasome in the, in the intestinal epithelial cells the recipient of gamma regulating factor? Perfect question. Two slides, and I'll give you a very detailed answer. Um, it actually took us three years just to ask this question, so, uh, and, and another two years to answer it. Um, so, so in one of our recent studies, uh, Mayan Levy, a talented graduate student in the lab, actually tried to mechanistically address this group of associations and to, to try and make sense of them in, in a more biochemically relevant uh, manner. Um, and, and, and what she found actually um, ended up being uh, very insightful um, in understanding this uh, coexistent and co-evolution of, of the microbiome and the host. So, so what Mayan found, uh, for example, um, is that um, this uh, inflammasome, this NLRP6 inflammasome that, that is uh, highly expressed in intestinal epithelial cell is totally dependent for its activation and formation by the existence of a microbiome. So you can see that when we compared in one of the experiments um, um, the, the activation of this inflammasome by, by uh, activation by cleavage of caspase 1, which is this effector protein part of the NLRP6 inflammasome, you can see that in the absence of a microbiome in, in these sterile mice, the, uh, the inflammasome is completely non-activated, and it becomes activated once we colonize these mice with microbes. <coughs> so this is a single uh, species of bacteria? No, no, this is not a single species of bacteria. This is, yeah. SPF is not a single species of bacteria. This is a controlled, diverse, and complex microbiome configuration, which is not as diverse as, uh, you know, taking a mouse in the wild, but it is composed of between 200 and 500 species of bacteria. So it's, it's, it's a highly complex and uh, biologically relevant uh, microbiome configuration. When, um, w so when, when this inflammasome is formed upon the, the exposure to, to, to a normal commensal microbial uh, colonization, uh, this inflammasome um, starts working, and one of the hallmarks in this particular context is a high secretion of uh, steady state levels of allatine. So if you do any mouse work in your own work, and you would test allatine under normal steady state conditions, you will find high levels of allatine in your intestines uh, which is a hallmark of homoestasis, and it is induced by this very uh, inflammasome. Now, if we disrupt any component of this NLRP6 inflammasome, you can see that IL-18 levels in the gut are dramatically uh, reduced also in the protein level. And what does it do? What we found uh, by a series of uh, RNA-seq experiments is that intestinal steady state IL-18 actually reprograms the intestinal epithelial cell um, expression profile. And one of the biggest hallmarks um, is the upregulation of a very uh, distinct set of what we call antimicrobial peptides, which are these natural antibiotics, which our intestinal cells produce in order to influence the composition and the function of our individualized microbiome. So there's a kind of a, a yin and yang uh, relationship between us and the host, where the microbiome affects the host transcriptional programming, which in turn results in a differential secretion of these natural antibiotics, which promote some microbes over the others, and this is how we found uh, homeostasis to exist. So if, so if, you, uh, if you disrupt either IL-18 in, in using IL-18 knockout mice or NLRP6 knockout mice, you completely disrupt this antimicrobial program, resulting <coughs> in the de novo development of an altered microbiome configuration, of a dysbiotic configuration. Now, to your question, it was equally interesting and fascinating to understand what happens when this disease-associated microbiome is transferred into a host which has a normal inflammasome. So why does it take over and why does it transfer disease susceptibility when the host starts as com being completely normal? So to answer this question, we developed, uh, uh, actually we developed this back in my postdoc and, and we've extensively used this here, a system called co-housing in which we cohabitate mice of different genotypes in the same cage for a few weeks. We exploit here um, a disgusting characteristic of mice that are coprophages, so they, they love to uh, massively eat each other's feces. So the mouse is a perfect tool to study the transfer of microbiome configurations. And in this case, for example, if we co-house wild-type mice with wild-type mice, with in-house wild-type mice, or with inflammasome-deficient mice, after a few weeks, we reach a point in which we have two groups of mice that are, that are genetically identical, of course, 
and only differ with, res re with regards to the microbiome that they carry. So the wild type, uh, uh, micro the, the wild type mice carry the wild type microbiome, but these wild type mice have been transferred by this dominant microbiome, and now we can compare the two uh, wild type uh, uh, recipient groups and see what the, the different microbiomes are doing to the host. And when we did this, as you suggested, we were surprised to find that in these recipient wild type mice that have a completely normal uh, inflammasome machinery, the transfer of an inflammasome deficient microbiome resulted in a significant suppression of this invaded inflammasome machinery. So you can see that these wild type mice now have a much reduced caspase 1 activation, much reduced IL-18 secretion, although they are capable of activating their own inflammasome and secreting their own IL-18. And this, as you, imagine, you may imagine, resulted in a very <coughs> big disturbance to the uh, antimicrobial uh, uh, profile in these uh, uh, recipient mice, resulting in the formation of uh, uh, a niche that highly supports the invading microbiome over the um, original in indigenous uh, microbiome. And um, taking it further, we wanted to understand what are the biochemical mechanisms by which the normal microbiome activates this inflammasome under normal wild type conditions, and what are the other mechanisms by which this disease-associated microbiome inhibits the, micro the, the inflammasome upon uh, transfer into wild type mice. So we performed a very detailed uh, um, combined metagenomic shotgun uh, analysis of these recipient mice and a metabolomic uh, um, analysis of the many different small molecules that these uh, two configurations uh, secrete. We developed a computational pipeline that enables to combine the genomic pathway analysis and the metabolomic biochemical analysis to identify candidates that are either up or down regulated in the two extreme contexts. And to make a very, very, very long story short, we were able to discover 27 small molecules associated with the different microbiomes that impact uh, inflammasome signaling. Of these, we focused on the three most dramatically uh, uh, affect our uh, uh, proteins. And for example, you can see uh, one such, uh, uh, not, not protein, small molecules. For example, you can see a uh, one molecule called taurine that um, is highly prevalent in the wild type microbiome configuration, and it activates the NLRP6 inflammasome. You can see that the addition of taurine in one of the experiments here uh, induces caspase 1 activation and a dose dependent increase in IL-18 secretion, while two other molecules, histamine and spermine, oh, again, histamine, um, not the histamine that you're uh, you may remember from your physiology studies that is secreted uh, um, by, by host immune cells, but actually histamine, which is secreted by the microbiome, are actually very prevalent in the microbiome of inflammasome deficient mice. And when they are high in their concentrations, they uh, actually inhibit in the NLRP6 inflammasome. You can see here examples of caspase 1 inhibition and a dose-dependent IL-18 inhibition. And what we discovered was that the combination, the, the, the molar combination of these and other metabolites actually determines the net activation of the NLRP6 inflammasome. And this is a very, I think, elegant way by, by which the, um, uh, the microbes may affect the host uh, pathways um, uh, that participate in their mutual uh, niche formation. And these and many other experiments that Mayan performed uh, that I will not go into uh, for the sake of time enable us to propose a new mechanism um, which I think illustrates the core evolutionary nature of microbiome and host uh, physiology by which the microbiome and the host co-participate in forming their own beneficial niche um, through the modulation and the signaling related to uh, a number of small molecules of metabolites and from the host side, uh, um, uh, differential expression and secretion of antimicrobial peptides. Um, so in the, in the normal uh, situation, these uh, mechanisms ensure that the microbiome, which is very important and, and beneficial for the host, would be supported in its normal configuration by this set of criteria. When we disrupt the, the host innate, innate uh, uh, pathways that are associated with this uh, homeostatic reaction, we disrupt also the, the profile of antimicrobial peptide, resulting in the development of dysbiosis. And when we take this dysbiotic configuration and transfer it into a wild type host, it uh, features an inherent ability to alter its metabolite profile in a way that kidnaps the very same pathways that um, are there to, to ensure normal uh, uh, flourishing of a microbiome in order to hijack them and to um, confer a competitive advantage for itself. So, so this is, I think, a, a, a nice pr uh, proof of, of coevolution. Of course, this is a proof of concept. One pathway 
a few metabolites out of tens of thousands of different metabolites, and there are more players probably involved in such uh, uh, mechanisms. So I've given you a few examples of endogenous host uh, processes that are involved in the shaping of the microbiome and um, are involved in transmission of the microbiome effects into host physiology. And um, I would also like to give you a few examples of how environmental signals impact the microbiome and through the microbiome impact our propensity to develop disease. And um, of, of the many things that we study at the lab, uh, one of the major things is, is the axis related to diet and how diet affects the microbiome and how diet and the microbiome potentially may affect our, our physiology. So, you know, this brings us to, to, to a very big question uh, in human medicine, not just in science, which is um, the fact that, um, you know, we're experiencing a, a very big uh, environmental change in, in, uh, in the last one or two centuries uh, following the Industrial Revolution, which uh, are closely associated with a propensity to develop uh, important diseases that were relatively rare beforehand. Uh, and and uh, obesity, cancer, uh, inflammatory diseases are, are some, some of these examples. And when looking into the last century, uh, one of the biggest uh, changes that we as a species uh, experience is, is uh, a change in our dietary composition. Um, and, and so, so, um, so I would say that uh, um, diet may be one of the suspects uh, potentially explaining these uh, changes. So in this elegant study, um, you know, uh, taking the very extreme situation of comparing endogenous um, um, human populations uh, in Central uh, Africa and Central America to um, modern populations, mainly in the US, <coughs> and massively sequencing their gut microbiome, um, you can see that there's a huge change in the diversity of the microbiome between these uh, you know, uh, uh, hunter-gatherer populations of humans to all of us, to, to the modern lifestyle uh, populations. You can see that we have dramatically lost a lot of our, the diversity of our microbiome, which points to the microbiome as potentially involved in these uh, very important uh, uh, environmental changes. <coughs> so th this made us uh, focus on, on diet and to, in trying to understand whether diet indeed um, affects uh, the composition and the function of the microbiome. And, and again, to make a very long story short, we, we and others have found that of all the environmental changes, if there's one really strong reproducible change from the environment that affects our microbiome, it is diet. We can take, for example, in, in this study that um, was published a couple of years ago, one study by our colleagues and one study by us, you can take a human and you change that human's diet, and within two days when you sequence by shotgun metagenomic sequencing, you would find a very dramatic change in the composition and function of our microbiome. Um, so, so of all the changes, diet seems to be very important in promoting these uh, uh, changes. <coughs> we contributed um, to, to this notion and to, to its mechanisms by looking at one of the modern constituents that uh, we've introduced into our diet in the last 100 years and has created a, a lot of, uh, I would say, controversy around the nutritional world in, in the last century, which are non-caloric uh, non artificial sweeteners which I'm sure many of you are using. Um, these, these are considered to be uh, very sweet and very inert because uh, they, they do not seem to have any um, effects on the host, on the human host. They are not metabolized by the human host and therefore they're non-caloric, so they don't produce any energy. So they are massively, uh, uh, massively um, advertised as, as being inert, sweet, and, and perfect for, for our sweet tooth. However, there's a lot of a lot of uh, collateral evidence uh, suggesting that they may not be inert. And in this study, we found that indeed these, uh, or some of these uh, uh, artificial sweeteners are indeed inert to the host, but they're far from being inert to our microbes. So the, in some microbiome configurations and in some human or animal model host, these artificial sweeteners actually may be metabolized by the microbes, change the microbiome configuration to one that would um, uh, promote health risk mainly um, um, a risk for uh, glucose intolerance, which is a little bit counterintuitive because many of us take these non-caloric artificial sweeteners exactly to tackle our uh, risk to develop uh, glucose intolerance. So in this, in this work, and I'm just showing you just a, a little snippet of, of what, we've, what uh, we've done, and when I say we, it is uh, another graduate student named Yotam Suetz. Um, We've uh, massively looked for the mechanisms of these effects in animal models, but also looked in, in uh, large human cohorts. And you can see here one of the results in these close to 300 humans in which we saw that uh, high consumers 
of artificial sweeteners um, featured um, a, a much more uh, significantly a higher metabolic susceptibility to develop uh, impaired glucose tolerance. Um, and this was highly associated with a different microbiome uh, in these individuals. But again, this was an association, a correlation. And the million dollar question was whether we could prove some sort of causality. So to do this, um, in, in another study, Yotam took a group of individuals that never, um, never uh, uh, consume uh, artificial sweeteners in their normal life. And he gave them um, saccharin, which is uh, one of the major uh, uh, sweeteners <coughs> used in Israel, for a period of five days while extensively um, monitoring them by continuous glucose monitors, which monitor the blood sugar levels every five minutes of an entire week, and their microbiome every day of that week. And what Yutam could identify was that we could um, distinguish between two subgroups of individuals. There are individuals which start to consume uh, uh, non-caloric artificial sweeteners and their glycemic response, this is a glycemic tolerance test, do not change from, the, from before to after they consume uh, these sweeteners. But there's another subgroup of individuals which upon the exposure to artificial sweeteners develop um, a very profound disturbance, new disturbance uh, in their blood sugar control, even though that these were given for a very short period of time. And to further prove causality, he took the microbiomes from these responders or non-responders and transfer them into germ-free mice and then look to see what, what these microbes were actually doing to germ-free mice. And what he could see that was that when he transferred the microbiomes from the non-responders, the glycemic responses of their mice remained normal and unaltered. However, when he did the same from the responders, the microbiomes from after the exposure induced a much higher tendency to develop glycemic, altered glycemic responses as compared to the glycemic responses from, from the same individuals from before the exposure to artificial sweeteners, which is close to the best we could do at that period in terms of the, uh, of the movement from association to causality. Since this uh, study, there have been many, many follow-up studies in animals and in humans corroborating and supporting various uh, parts of our uh, of our observations. Uh, I can note one uh, study that was published two weeks ago from the Karolinska looking prospectively into 3,000 uh, um, um, adult uh, females uh, who consume uh, either uh, a fixed, not very high amount of uh, diet beverages uh, containing aspartame to sweetened to sugar containing beverages or to anything at all. And what they, shown, what they have shown is that uh, consumption of either sugar sweetened or artificial sweetened uh, beverages induces a significant risk to develop diabetes, which is indistinguishable between the artificial sweeteners and the sugar and is greater than the water drinking controls. Um, and this really opened up a new field uh, because it, it suggested that many of the, many of the food ingredients that uh, we have introduced into our diet in the last century, synthetically manufactured and, and not part of our normal microbial evolution may impact <coughs> our microbiome in ways which are unpredictable. For example, a, a, a paper by colleagues of us have uh, recently shown that uh, some dietary emulsifiers of the kind that you all have in your refrigerator as we speak, because they are, for example, part of ketchup, um, actually may promote changes in the microbiome which would induce uh, similar obesity and other uh, metabolic uh, changes. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the effort that is undergoing um, in, in better understanding these effects. <coughs> but what we've discovered was not just um, how what we eat, how the content of our, our uh, diet um, impacts our, our microbiome, but we've discovered that the timing of our feeding or when we eat is also equally interesting and important in impacting our microbiome and our downstream uh, metabolic phenotypes. And in, in that regard, we focused on circadian rhythmicity, which is a really blooming field unrelated to ours. Um, in the last 15 years, it has been discovered that not only do we have a central clock in our super suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus that perceives light and coordinate, uh, coordinates many of our physiological uh, uh, behaviors, but actually every organ and every cell in our body has a clock, has a clock machinery, and the, the, um, the basic clock machinery uh, was deciphered. So we have millions of clocks in each one of our cells which miraculously are totally coordinated with each other in, in, in um, promoting uh, normal physiology. And actually there are big, if you open your smartphone, you'll see big atlases kind of depicting which 
cellular or organ functions are more predominant in which time of the day. So this is a huge field. And since we regard the, the microbiome as if you may as uh, um, a neglected organ, we asked a very naive question, which is, does the microbiome feature a, a diurnal or circadian rhythmicity like every other cell or organ in our body? And this was uh, work done by a graduate student named Christoph Theis in my lab, and the answer was a, a very clear yes. And we found that the gut microbiome features a differing composition and function at different times of the day, which was highly reproducible. You can see this uh, to happen in, in the composition, which changes in different times of the day, in pathways that change in different times of the day, and even in higher functions, such as uh, flagellar assembly, which incorporates many different metabolic pathways to occur. And all of these together go up and down in different times of the day. You can see, for example, in this heat map, looking at microbial pathways at different times of the day, that many of the pathways go up in the night, down in the day, up in the night, down in the day, and so on and so forth. Now, this behavior was very surprising to us, because if you think about it, all of our gut microbes live completely in the dark, so how the hell do they know that it's day and that it's night? And uh, the, the answer was that um, the two major variables that affect this microbial behavior are the host clock machinery and are the timing of our nutrition. So for example, when we compare the wild type mice to mice that um, are ablated for their host uh, core clock machinery, these are period one and two deficient mice that do not have a normally functioning clock in any of their cells, and we sequence their microbes in different times of the day. You can see that in contrast to the wild type mice that feature this very diurnal activity of their microbes, these clock deficient mice completely lose this behavior and, and the behavior becomes completely sporadic. But more importantly, the major regulator of our microbial circadian rhythmicity is the timing of our eating. So for example, in this experiment, when we take mice and we force feed them only during the night, or we force feed them only during the day, these are wild type mice, and we sequence their gut microbes, you can see, for example, in these bacterial families, that we can completely control the phase of the microbial composition or behavior, it doesn't really matter, um, um, and we can move it by 12 hours via the timing of nutrition. So nutrition seems to be the, the or the timing of nutrition seems to be the major uh, regulator of this microbial circadian rhythmicity. Now, is it functionally important? And to, to answer this question, we performed a series of experiments both in mice and in humans, and we subjected both to severe disruption of their normal awake sleep cycle. So in mice, we utilized this uh, jet lag, severe jet lag mouse model, which if, if would occur in humans, it would mean that you would fly a human from Tel Aviv to Tokyo back and forth every three days for 21 times. So this is a very severe jet lag. And we performed in humans a study that for two weeks made me the most attractive uh, young PI at the Weizmann Institute because I took a group of students and I flew them all over the world. And the only request was for them to complete a diary and to collect their microbiome during, before, and after jet lag. Um, and when we, when we did this, we uh, found that the gut microbiome, both in, in this jet-lagged or, or um, circadian disrupted uh, mice or humans, was significantly uh, altered. But in order to prove causality, we took these different microbiomes from before, during, and after jet lag, and we transferred them into germ-free mice. And we could, um, by doing so, induce a very severe state of obesity and diabetes um, in mice recipients of jet lag microbiome, both in, in the uh, recipients of, of the mouse microbiomes or of the human microbiomes. And this, this was very important because if you look at the medical literature for the last 70 years, there's a very striking association between uh, human individuals that are engaged in chronic shift work um, in this modern lifestyle of ours um, and a propensity to develop obesity, diabetes, and even cancer. And, and up to now, we, we didn't know what was the missing link. And what we suggest <coughs> here is that at least one of these missing links uh, may be mediated by the regulation of the behavior of our internal gut microbes. Now, in a, in a follow-up study, which was actually published just a week ago, uh, Christoph asked the reverse question, which was not only if the microbes are regular or the, the circadian gut microbial behavior is regulated by the host or by its feeding behavior, but whether this circadian microbiome also have downstream effect on the host physiology uh, or on the host clock or circadian activity. And, and the answer was, was, again, a clear yes. It seems to be a bilateral kind of interaction. So, so for example, when you disrupt the circadian microbiome by the administration of wide spectrum antibiotics or by performance of experiments in germ-free mice, which do not have any microbes, and, and, and measure 
the transcriptome at different times of the day of the host, you can find, uh, and, and this was found way before us, that under steady state condition, a significant number of, of, of transcripts act in a very circadian manner. So 15 to 20 percent of all of our transcripts in every organ of our body are completely regulated by the circadian clock machinery. But when we disrupt the microbes in the gut, and for example, look at this uh, host circadian activity in the transcriptional level, you can see that a few hundreds of the host circadian uh, uh, um, uh, transcripts don't care about whether the microbes are there or the microbes are not there. Th this very nice circadian activity remains the same. And actually among these genes are the genes encoding the core clock machinery itself. So the core clock of the host doesn't care whether there are microbes or no microbes. However, you can find another group of uh, many hundreds of genes that normally feature a circadian activity, but upon the disruption of the microbes, completely lose this circadian activity. And there are many functions related to these genes. But most interesting to us was a surprising finding in which we found a few hundred genes that normally are not circadian in their activity whatsoever. But upon the disruption of the microbes, they suddenly become very circadian. And when you look at the functions of these genes, they are amazingly similar to functions that are normally encoded by the microbes themselves. So, so this brings the hypothesis, I have no way to prove it at this point, that some of these activities of the metamor meta-organism are normally provided by the microbes, but once you disrupt the microbes, they actually are transferred to the host site. Um, now, now, this was uh, in the gut. Our next mechanistic question uh, was how does the, microbe, uh, the, the microbial circadian rhythmicity affect the host transcriptional uh, uh, circadian rhythmicity? And there we performed a very large-scale uh, epigenetic studies looking mainly at, at uh, histone uh, acetylations. Um, and what we found was uh, uh, that uh, the, the, these transcriptional effects were strikingly regulated by epigenetic modifications in both the active promoter and enhancer regions. So by disrupting the microbes, we affected along the same lines, the same groups of genes uh, in terms of their activation status. And I think this is uh, one of the first examples of, of, of a possible mechanism by which microbes affect our host physiology. And uh, what was also very interesting to us was that, and, and this was half an accident, we, we, up to now we, we mainly look at the gut. And you know, the gut is where the microbes live, so, so it kind of is very intuitive to, to speculate that uh, um, a changed gut micro, microbial behavior would alter the um, circadian behavior of, of epithelial cells in the gut. But we also looked in the liver, which is many miles away from where the microbes actually live. And, and we, we actually sequenced uh, uh, the, the, the transcriptome in the liver at different times of the day, under normal state, and when we disrupted the microbes, again, that live very far away from where the liver is, and we could find the exact same pattern of behavior, where hundreds of genes, including the core clock genes themselves, don't care in the liver whether there are microbes in the gut or not, but many other genes lose their circadian rhythmicity or gain circadian rhythmicity upon the disruption of microbes very far away from them. So, so this brings the obvious question, how potentially could, could this be explained? Which brings us back to the metabolites, which I've mentioned before. And what we discovered was that the gut metabolites, these thousands of small molecules that are modulated by the gut microbiome, also uh, feature, or 25% of them feature, a very nice circadian activity or circadian changes in their, in their levels in the gut. And when we looked at the serum metabolites, we found uh, a very similar circadian behavior. And all of these circadianly active serum uh, uh, metabolites originate from the gut. And when we disrupt uh, the gut microbes by antibiotics or by performing of experiments in germ-free mice, we completely inhibit this serum circadian uh, changes in the level of these metabolites. And one would imagine that these uh, changing levels in metabolites in the serum, which reach every sterile organ in our body, um, may impact the circadian activity downstream to the clock in these organs. And at least in the liver, this is exactly what we were able uh, to prove. Yeah. OK. So um, um, I will just finish this, and I will skip. Uh, uh, my, my last part, due to lack of time, um, I, I will just say that this, this uh, circadian, uh, this, this really um, surprising circadian influence of, of the gut microbes um, on the liver um, was um, functionally important. Um, and we've proven this with one important uh, liver function, which is drug metabolism. So um, 
Uh, you know that many of the drugs that we take are metabolized by the liver under normal cir circumstances uh, and de detoxified by the liver. Uh, we've taken one drug, uh, paracetamol, acamol, which is uh, not only uh, a very commonly induce, uh, uh, used uh, drug, but also the very most common uh, cause of, of liver toxicity, of drug-related toxicity as a whole in humans. Um, and what we found was that it really uh, is impacted by the circadian activity of the liver. So if you take this drug during the morning or during the evening, your chances of reaching high levels due to changes in the detoxification pathways in the, in the liver are, are very different from the morning to the evening. And this circadian detoxification uh, behavior in the liver is totally de dependent on the gut microbial circadian rhythmicity because when we took mice, disrupted their microbial circadian rhythmicity and gave the drug during the morning or during the evening, we lost this tendency of changing uh, metabolism between morning and evening and we actually rescued the mice from their tendency to develop high toxicity levels when this drug was administered in the evening. And, and this, you, you may imagine, is, is, is an opening to modulation of many different host physiological uh, functions by modulation of functions that are counterintuitive and mediated by the microbes. Um, and I think with that um, and the shortage of time, um, I, I will stop here um, and, and just tell you that, um, you know, what, what I think the, the, the challenge of the microbiome uh, field is, is to really move from, uh, from the associative, the, the correlation uh, uh, status, um, uh, which, which marks many of the papers that, that you will see um, about potential effects of the microbiome towards causality. We're very young, so we are very limited in our technologi technological capabilities in, in this re regard. And I've given you a few, a few examples of the effort that we're making to, to develop and to evolve towards this uh, idea. Uh, and, and I think that the second, um, the second take home message, uh, for me at least as, as a physician in my previous life, is that in addition to finding mechanism, me mechanisms of, of by which the, the microbiome and its interaction with the host may affect physiology or the, the uh, risk for disease, I think that the, 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 the microbiome represents a, a very attractive genome or second genome that in contrast to our first genome, which is very important, I, I'm not saying that it's not, um, is amenable to, to change and to modulation. So, so this second genome, this microbial genome, may be impacted by antibiotics on the one hand. We don't think antibiotics are the silver bullet, but by, by changes in diet, by perhaps changes uh, by, by um, inflicted by administration of probiotics, um, and, and uh, by changes in metabolites uh, uh, that are disrupted in certain disease uh, um, context. So, so I think that uh, studying the microbiome would allow us not only to, to understand better the, the physiology of the, the, of the holobiome, of, of the, this entire machine, that, that we, we mainly studied one aspect of it uh, so far, but also to develop new therapeutic targets that, that would enable to massively change the microbiome uh, um, in ways that we didn't think about and to impact uh, our risk for disease. And here, I think I'll stop. And after frightening you to death, uh, have a good lunch. <laughs> well, thank you very much.